Bambi for a, for a very, very long time, and uh, it's since way before she started Vader. And it's an honor to be here tonight with uh, two of our portfolio companies, both Evernote and Lending Club. And in case anyone's wondering, I'm not just fat, I am expecting. It's my own little startup <laughs> that I'm working on. Um, so Renault is, uh, is really a, a, an exceptional CEO. And in addition to being the CEO of Lending Club, Renault Laplanche was a two-time national French sailing champion, something we always look for in our CEOs. He uh, also was a uh, securities attorney, something we typically don't look for in our CEOs. And he had sold one company prior to uh, Lending Club to Oracle and started out Lending Club with some of his, uh, his team from that company, Triple Hub. So as Phil alluded to earlier, you know, timing's everything. And we were lucky enough to have invested in Lending Club in Q1 of 2009. And I don't know if you guys recall that very well, but Lehman had just crashed and the credit markets were frozen. So if you were a lender or if you were a borrower at that point in time, you know, good luck getting a loan, even with an 800 plus FICO. And if you were a lender wanting anything more than maybe a quarter point uh, return on your capital, good luck with that too. So this was the environment that we, uh, we entered into when we looked at Lending Club, and we just thought, time means everything, and the banks are frozen, the credit markets are frozen, and here was this little startup you know, trying to solve that problem. And so they've done a really phenomenal job to date. The other thing Phil referred to is that the first mover advantage is, I think, really a fallacy in the Valley, and in and, and most places. And uh, Lending Club was not the first mover here. There was a company out called Prosper that had started a couple years before. And Lending Club is, uh, has emerged as the clear winner in this space, many multiples larger than their, than their closest competitor. And they did that by executing. They executed incredibly well. They, uh, they focused on only the top tier of consumers. They were completely uncompromising in their hiring of their team leading to perhaps the longest executive search of any company I've ever seen. It was a two-year search for one of our key execs in the company. And they have just been uncompromising in a long-term vision. So a lot of the, uh, the decisions that were made in the company caused short-term pain, but a long-term reward. And I think that's really what sets a company apart um, from being sort of a, a small acquisition to a really, really large company. Over the past year, Lending Club's hit a number of, uh, of huge milestones. They become, became cash flow positive. They crossed over a billion dollars in total originations. And last month was their biggest month on record at over $100 million um, dollars in originations for the company. They also added some uh, pretty amazing members to their board. And let me tell you, it's been uh, very interesting interviewing these people for potential board positions. They, uh, they brought in Mary Meeker. Uh, John Mack, the former CEO of Morgan Stanley, and also most recently Larry Summers, the former U.S. Treasury Secretary. So Lending Club is on a truly amazing path, and it's been a real pleasure to, uh, to be a member of their board. So with that, I give you uh, Renaud LaPlanche. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. <clears throat> so I realize I'm the last man standing between you and drinks, so I'm try, I'll try to make, it, uh, to make it short. And uh, I'll try also to make it as uh, interactive as possible. So um, I know there are uh, microphones um, in the audience. Um, I'll try to make my uh, talk short and uh, I'll leave plenty of time for, for questions. Um, <clears throat> So um, Bambi Francisco, when um, she invited me here, asked me to focus on the things we learned over the last five years. Um, and, and so that's what I'm gonna do, and really focusing on five key learnings. So the first thing you might say is, uh, we only learned fi five things in five years, so we are, we're not very quick learners. Um, but, but the good news is we did not learn anything for the first three years, so we're really getting, really getting better at it. <coughs> So the five, five things I'd like to focus on, um, the first one is really the process of innovation and, and talking a little bit more about the first mover advantage and what, what that means and, and other aspects of innovation that I, I find interesting. Um, <clears throat> the second is, being, uh, is about um, sort of optimizing value and I call that not, not, not being greedy. 
Um, the third, uh, to Rebecca's point about, about executive search, uh, is about hiring great people. And uh, the fourth one is about building trust, um, which is <clears throat> one of the strongest assets we can possibly build for, for the long run. And really the fifth one is uh, about being uh, data-centric, data-driven, and uh, always uh, reminding ourselves that very often the answer is in the data. So the, the first, um, first thought here and first thing we learned really is, is about the process of innovation. And so very often um, innovation is really um, not an ID from scratch. Um, uh, it's it's some, sometimes just recombining uh, things that, that already existed before in a different format or for a different delivery channel and just making it better. And, and throughout history, uh, you, you, you've seen that, and, and sort of more recently over the last few years, an inktomy um, was, uh, uh, was the, the way we, we used to, the tool we used to search the web in uh, 1995. Um, and, and obviously, um, <coughs> it's no longer the case, and, and, and now Google came along. Um, Apple didn't invent the, um, uh, didn't invent the, um, the uh, MP3 player technology, uh, there were MP3 players 10 years before, uh, before the iPod uh, came along. Um, <clears throat> and so in, in, in many cases, and there are scores of examples um, that, that build on, on the same theme. So there are many, many examples of companies sort of um, taking on an ID and, and or product and making it better. Um, and that's really what, what we've done at Landing Club. Uh, there was this emerging industry of peer-to-peer -peer landing with Zopa uh, that started in the UK and Prosper in the US. And uh, being a close follower and launching a year and a half or two years after Prosper was a great place to be in because you, you already get um, someone in the marketplace uh, testing new ideas, um, showing, showing what's working, showing what's not working, and you can really build on that. I found that to be a, a much uh, easier process than, than starting from scratch. Uh, so in the case of Prosper, we, we, we saw that the, the idea was working, that, that the company was getting traction, uh, but there were a few things that we said we, we would do differently and we could test these different ideas and then come in um, from behind, but, but then take, take a, a massive lead in the market and we are now about 10 times larger than, than the second company in the space. So there's a thought on, again, on first mover advantage. Um, <laughs> the second aspect is about um, not always wanting to be innovative. Uh, if you're about to go into surgery, you probably don't, don't want uh, the team doing that, that job to be the most innovative uh, team around. Um, <clears throat> and you know, Rockefeller used to say, be um, daring in design, but cautious in execution. Um, and I think that's, that's a lot of what we've done at, at Landing Club. We, <clears throat> we have a, a grand plan. That's, Landing Club is a really big idea. It's about transforming and, and eventually replacing the US banking system. Um, so it's, it, it's a high goal. Um, I think we're being very uh, daring in design um, in, in sort of, uh, launching the platform, but really the execution of it has to rely on a lot of data, a lot of risk management, of internal control, on, on platform security, on a lot of, of minutia, um, but where, where sort of implementing best practices and uh, taking advantage of, of all the learnings uh, that, uh, that we could acquire uh, from, from the banks sometimes uh, has, been, um, has been a key factor of success so far. So that, that's a key, first key learning, be innovative um, at the right time. <clears throat> so the, the second, uh, second thought is um, about capturing value. And so one thing that really helped us get a lot of traction initially was rewarding our initial customers, in our case, the initial investors on the platform. As Rebecca said, we, we launched the platform in 2007. We very quickly um, went into 2008 and 2009, and that wasn't a great time to sell consumer lending to, to investors. Consumer lending was everywhere in the, in the headlines. And, um, <clears throat> and, so what, and, and asking investors to buy sort of loans and essentially make loans to strangers on the internet um, why wasn't the easier sell in the absence of any track record showing investors, yes, it is working, and yes, we're good at risk management and we're good at servicing the loans, and, and you're going to make a good return. And now we have the opposite effect of we, we, 
very often we're getting too much money from, from investors, uh, but at the time it really wasn't the case. And so one of the things we did to uh, encourage early investors was really to reward them by making them shareholders in the company. So initially we had a warrant program and, and some of the early investors who put in $100,000 or $200,000 on the platform, which was a big investment for us at the time when, when we were doing 500,000 a month in non-originations, um, <clears throat> we, we, we were able to get some warrant coverage on their investment. And that's really something that, that had a, a multiplying effect for us because that made these investors more loyal to the platform and they knew that they could invest more and get rewarded that way. But it also turned them into more of evangelists, right? They, they not only had a good experience and wanted to share that experience, uh, but, but they, they were getting rewarded for, for sharing that experience and they, they were more likely to invest the time in going out of their way and, and uh, helping us market the platform. So that's been a, really a great thing we did initially to build up support from a broader base of people and, and really have a lot of people having a vested interest in the company being successful. Uh, <laughs> and then as, as we got bigger, uh, the, the bigger gift uh, we, we made uh, was really sort of, um, with setting up distribution partnerships. Um, and uh, so the investment, in the investment world, um, <clears throat> the, the broker dealers and the financial advisors are um, sort of really sort of important players in that industry. And very early on, I mean, the, what we found is um, the, we shouldn't try to optimize economics for the long run. Right? The, what matters initially is to be on, on the large platforms, to be visible, uh, to be well known, to earn credibility. And then there's a time for optimization. But sort of overpaying initial distribution partners uh, was also one of the great things we did to, uh, to get traction. So hiring great people, uh, <laughs> that, that, that sort of sounds uh, obvious. Um, <clears> that you shouldn't hire uh, great people rather than bad ones. Uh, but what, one um, specific, uh, specific example that I think helped drive the point home is to, to look at what, what we call B players, right? So these people who are not great, they're not the A players, uh, but they're not bad. And most of the time they do an okay job and there's really no reason to fire them and no urgency in replacing them. They're doing an okay job, and as entrepreneurs, uh, you all have a lot of other things to do than solving the not urgent problem of replacing someone who's doing an okay job. Uh, but that, what really um, um, <clears throat> happens when you're sort of building a team and you get, uh, so in green is the A player, so you get a team of two A players, and then you get a B player, um, what, what really happens then is that person is not going to do such a great job and it, it's going to be frustrating, uh, but not enough to uh, make a decision to replace the person. But very often what we found is um, a B player is going to hire C players. And, and, and it comes down from there. Uh, and, and you get C and, and Ds and Es uh, as, as you hold out the, the org chart. Um, and, that's, and, and that's really the, the worst thing that can happen to an organization because then you get uh, a lot of people who are really not up to the task um, and, and eventually would create a culture of underperforming, an underperforming team. And the other thing that happens, and that's where the cost gets exponential, is uh, not only you're not getting great value from, from that person, you're getting uh, a lot of mediocre uh, hires underneath, but what, what you end up getting also is losing some of the A players. Uh, because something that A players want is, is working with other people of the same quality, other people who care as much about doing a great job, uh, and, and that's going to have a ripple effect across the entire company. So that's what we learned, and I wanted to share it, and that's probably one of the, the most important thing um, so entrepreneurs and CEOs should be focusing on is building a team of great people, because then everything rolls out from there, and, and you end up with great people two, three, four levels down in the organization. And if you have a lot of great people, you end up building a great company. Um, <clears throat> so the, the other um, thing that, that maybe is less, less obvious is uh, focusing on building trust. Um, so it's obvious in our case, we, we sell investments. Um, so a lot of what we do is really building trust with investors and especially initially in the absence of track record, we really had to uh, 
um, make investors trust us uh, based on, on our conviction. And now we have a lot of, of data that, that shows uh, that investors should be trusting us. But one of the things um, <clears throat> I found help build trust the most is uh, actually giving, giving the bad news. And giving bad news uh, early and often. Um, and it doesn't have to be often if, if there's no bad news. Uh, but, but most of the time, they're in, the, in, in, in the life of a company, there ends up being a lot of bad news. And then they're, if, if you're lucky, they're buried under tons of good news, and it doesn't matter that much. Uh, but, but I found that's where, as, as a CEO, as a leader, and as a partner, um, you, you, that's where you, you have the most opportunity to build credibility. And so there was a very specific example at, at Landing Club where at some point in 2008, we had to dramatically slow down origination and really retool the, uh, the platform um, and, and craft an entirely new regulatory framework. So we went from doing two million a month in origination to three million to four million a month, um, back down to 500,000 for a few months as we were, as we were retooling the, the platform. And at that time, we were at the peak uh, um, in April 2008 and doing four million a month. Um, I, I was faced with a decision. I, I knew we had to do the retooling and, and uh, there was no question as to whether that was the right decision or not. But really the question was how to uh, make that public and how to announce it. And I decided to announce it very quickly to everybody pretty much at the same time. And that was a great thing to do because that really helped me um, control the message entirely and make sure I was the source of that message and really own that message and, and, and reshape everybody's understanding of what that meant. Um, and uh, and we, we had lenders at the time and there was a MAC, close, a material adverse change clause in the contract and they could have pulled the line and the company would have filed for bankruptcy. So there was a very serious situation, but coming out, going out to my investors, my board, the lenders, uh, the employees, and everybody pretty much at the same time over a, a period of time of 24 hours um, was really a, a, the best thing I could possibly do and, and really good learning. And from then on, I got the habit of um, not waiting to internalize the bad news. I mean, uh, many entrepreneurs, if you're, if you're like me, you, you don't want to go out with a problem. You want to go out with a problem and a solution. And, and that's great if you can find the solution immediately. Uh, it's not great if it takes a, a week to find the solution and, and the problem has already uh, been leaked out and at that point you don't control the message anymore. Uh, so the last, um, last point I wanted to make before uh, opening up to, to questions is um, really about, about the value of the data and about, about being data centric and data driven. We, um, many of us uh, run web businesses or mobile businesses um, which is great because that, that really gives us so much opportunity to capture data and, 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 uh, and have this wealth of usage data that we can, we can analyze. And I've been in, in many meetings either as an investor into early stage companies or as an advisor to some companies or, or, or even at Landing Club in the early days where um, many people had opinions and, and we were spending a lot of time debating opinions where when the answer was, was really in the data and, and a, a, um, a data-driven uh, decision-making would have saved everybody a lot of time towards the right de decision and would have got to the right decision more often, more often than not. Um, so I decided to, to push that to an extreme. Um, and so the, the thought here is if you can't measure it, you can't, you can't control it. Um, and so what I've started doing recently is uh, as an example, and I'm gonna start posting that data uh, internally at, at the company, at Landing Club, I started tracking my time. And I think that's, that's a great thing you can do as a CEO, just for, for yourself to understand where you're spending your time, but also as a message to the rest of the company of, okay, this, the, we, we need to know what we're doing and then to, we need to measure it. So I started tracking how much time I spend on uh, it's sort of internally focused, talking to other people in the company, and externally focused, talking to investors, press, and, and partners. Um, and I found that I spend more of my time talking to press and partners, which is not good or bad, but it's, it's good to know uh, the extent of, of that. Then I also track uh, exactly what I spend my time on. And, and the point here is not precisely what I spend my time on, which, which you might not really care, uh, but it's really going through the exercise of tracking your time and, 
and knowing exactly where you spend time. And then that, that really helps making decision and align efforts with, and resources with priorities. Right? And if we're, we're saying this year, we want to work on the product, uh, I think starting to spend more time on product is, is, not, is not a bad place to start. Um, <clears throat> and then the, the other thing that, that you can do with this is really sort of start tracking the evolution of the data over time. And that, that really gives you a lot of, of insights into, um, in, into what, what can be done and, what, and, and how to prepare for it. Uh, for example, this, this shows what happens in the case of a fundraising. Right? So last round of financing, uh, I started spending disproportionate amount of my time externally focused, talking to investors. It's great to know that so that you can prepare the rest of the company, you can prepare the rest of the team um, and tell them, hey, I'm gonna spend 80% of my time not being here and, and I'm gonna need you to, uh, to do some of the things I used to do. So I found that to be particularly, uh, particularly helpful and a great learning for, for me personally and I'm, I'm planning to, to push that data out to the rest of the company. But the, the point behind it, besides just tracking my time, it's, it's really sort of paying attention to the data because very, very often the, the answer is in, in the data. Uh, th 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 thank you, that, that's uh, all I had for today uh, and I wanted to leave uh, plenty of time for questions. Hi, hi Renaud, Faith from Better News. Um, I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit. You said that um, you, your, your overall vision for Lending Club is to transform and eventually uh, replace the US banking system. I'm kind of wondering how are you gonna do that without uh, raising your interest rates? Because um, presumably you would eventually have to lend to people with bad credit. So how are you going to avoid becoming the US banking system? <laughs> Uh, I don't know if that's our goal. <laughs> okay, becoming the U.S. banking, the U.S. financial system uh, <coughs> wouldn't be a bad thing, um, other than the systemic <laughs> risk of, of having the entire system rely on lending club. <coughs> um, but yeah, I mean, certainly. So we, we we started by focusing on prime and super prime consumers, um, really as a way to build up uh, our track record and really deliver a predictable experience to investors. Right? We, we're bringing to individual investors a new asset class that individual investors couldn't, ac couldn't access and couldn't invest in before Lending Club came around. Um, so, so that required a lot of confidence building on our part uh, and, and really a delivery of a low volatility, uh, low, uh, a very predictable um, product to, to investors. Um, and so we had to focus on prime and super prime. Uh, but really the ambition is to be as useful as possible to as many people as possible. And so we, we uh, over time, we would expand uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, the population we're we are going to. And, and we'll do that, again, in a way that's very data-driven and that, that takes into account everything we are learning. And, and that's very measured. So going back to, uh, to being cautious in execution, uh, I don't think you'll see a lot of, of uh, abrupt moves uh, in, in the data or in the way we go about it. Uh, but the plan is certainly to expand to um, release new products. And today we do three years and five year um, personal loans, unsecured personal loans. Uh, but the goal is to start making auto loans and student loans and car loans and, and small business loans and, and mortgages and home equity lines of credit. So really cover the entire spectrum and cover the entire population. I loved your slides about how you track your time. Uh, what tools did you use for that? Uh, Excel. <laughs> <laughs> the very advanced Excel, Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah, I really like what you're doing. I think it's very interesting. But uh, how do you think your company is going to fair when, when and if we ever leave uh, a ZERP policy, zero interest rates? Yeah, <clears throat> so um, we, we don't think we are uh, rate sensitive. Uh, we, we believe we are rate insensitive. Um, what, what really happened, so certainly in, in today's environment, 
Uh, it's a very low interest rate. The Fed's rate are near zero. Um, <clears throat> and um, so when you earn six, seven, eight, nine percent net return on, on Lending Club, it, it's, a, it's a really big spread against the risk-free interest rate and it's very attractive to investors. I think the question is what, is what happens when people can earn three, four, five percent on a CD in a, in, in a no risk situation, would it still be uh, attracted to a six or seven percent or eight percent return on, on lending club? Um, so what's gonna happen in, in that kind of environment when, when interest rates rise is all, all interest rates are gonna rise in, in parallel, right? That, that's what happens. When, when the uh, Fed's rates are gonna go up, uh, LIBOR and, and prime rate are going to go up, and the lending rate on credit cards are gonna go up. Most credit cards are priced at LIBOR plus or prime plus. So there's gonna be an automatic adjustment of credit card interest rates, um, which will lead to a adjustment of lending club interest rates as well. Uh, and we, what we wanna do is provide value to our customers, and so we're tracking credit card rates very closely, and, and we are always going to be uh, more cost efficient and, and provide uh, a lower cost option than credit cards. But when credit cards are gonna go from 16 to 18 or 19%, uh, our rates are gonna go from 12 or 13 to 14 and 15%. So all the rates are gonna move in, in parallel. Um, so at that point, our returns to investors, instead of the average return being 9%, the return will go to 10 or 11%. So the spread over the uh, risk-free interest rate will remain about, about constant. Question in, in the front. Hi, Jim Ritchie, CEO of Delicious Karma. You mentioned you know, spending 60% of your time externally and 40 now. So two questions regarding that. One, is that optimized you know, today for you? And secondly, how has it changed you know, over the five years of your company? Right, no, great, great, great question. So <clears throat> um, I think it, it, it really depends, there's no right answer, it really depends on, on the team and how the workload is allocated between the CEO and the rest of the team. Um, I think um, <clears throat> I initially probably spent, so the first, first year, first two years, I was really working on product right? and, and pretty much doing nothing else than getting the product right, uh, with the exception of a couple of rounds of funding but the, the first round of funding was two phone calls and it was really a week of work. And, and the second round was, was pretty quick as well. Um, <clears throat> so I, I didn't spend pretty much any time at all uh, on the outside uh, in the first couple of years was really sort of focusing on the product. And um, as, as we launched the product and as I had to spend more time talking to investors on the platform and bringing these, investor, these early investors on the platform, I started spending more, more of my time on the, on the outside. Um, and it, so it's been sort of moving up gradually over, over the, um, the, the time spent externally focused has moved up gradually over, over the last five years. Um, right now it's at a point where yeah, I am spending about 60% of my time uh, on, on the outside. And I can only do that because we have a great team, right? We have a great team that's focused on executing and, and um, and I don't need to be at the office as much as I would have uh, if it wasn't for, for the team. Question up there. <laughs> yeah, we have a team. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> No, so uh, yeah, the question is how do we collect? Uh, so that, that's actually an example of not being very innovative, right? We, um, <clears throat> like, like a surgeon uh, would be. Um, <clears throat> so we, we, uh, we're very innovative in, in the way we acquire customers and the way we deliver the product. Um, the, uh, the collections operation is, is very similar to what a bank would do. Um, so we, in the first uh, 15 to 30 days, we have an in-house collections team that's really trying to work out the issue with, with the borrower. Um, when the loan gets um, 30 days past due, then we, we work with collection agencies that do the sort of annoying things that, that collection agencies do. Um, <clears throat> the, um, I think the, the one um, piece of innovation there is um, in the way we reach out to borrowers and we, we use uh, sort of more sort of social media tools and we can look at Facebook profile and LinkedIn profile 
there, there are a lot of restrictions as to what we can do, and obviously we can't sort of write on someone's wall on, on Facebook. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, would, I would love to do that. <laughs> we can't. Um, so the messages have to be private, uh, but we can use social media tools to track people and, and do better, a better job during these first 30 days. Um, and, and the other thing that's a little bit innovative uh, but really is a reflection of, of who we are. When a borrower starts being late on, on their payment, we can remind them that the money doesn't come from Citibank or Bank of America. The, the money that was invested in, in that person really came from people like him or like her. Uh, came from 200 people who are relying on that person making their payment this month to make their own payment and, uh, and to meet their own financial obligations and the, the people who trusted her. Um, and I think that, that softer sort of social pressure uh, angle is, is really working and really helping us delivering a better performance to investors. Congratulations on your progress. Uh, you set, state that your goal is to replace the US banking industry, but you were talking about this in, largely in terms of the lending side of, uh, of the equation, particularly with consumers. I'm curious as to what your view is of the credit card industry and the transaction side of the business and where the opportunities may lie going forward. Yeah, <clears throat> um, yeah I think we, uh, so we are very focused on lending products and um, on responsible lending products. Uh, and, and for that reason, we don't, we don't love revolving debt. Uh, I think what the credit card industry has done is really coupling a payment instrument with a credit instrument. And there's really no fundamental reason why these two products should be coupled. I think there are a lot of very innovative products uh, solving the payment side of things. Um, and I think that can be entirely decoupled from are you taking a loan or not. Uh, really, the, the credit card industry has uh, started sort of acquiring these loan balances through a payment mechanism. Um, but again, I, I think in the future, these two will be entirely decoupled that's gonna be great innovation in the payment industry. And we might or might not participate in, in that innovation, uh, but I think we'll, we'll be very focused on providing the lending part of it. And when, when you pay for something with, with your card or, or with new uh, payment technology, um, and if you decide to not pay that balance in full after 30 days, you do, it doesn't have to turn into a a revolving debt with a variable interest rate and, 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 and a lot of opacity as to what, what's gonna happen to that debt. I think you can, you can make the decision at that time to either pay it in full or take a loan uh, to finance that, that balance. But again, that, that should be decoupled from, from the payment mechanism. Okay, Renaud, we have, uh, we actually time's up, but I do have one last question, it's somewhat obvious, but um, you're, everybody here knows you're, you're well positioned to go public, so is that 2013 or 2014, and what are the factors that go into that decision? Uh, you know I can't answer that question. <laughs> um, so the, the official answer that Then I, you don't get the wine. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so the, the official answer that my general counsel has authorized me to give you is, uh, um, <clears throat> so we, I mean, we, we, we feel we'll be ready sometime next year. Uh, it doesn't mean, we'll, doesn't mean we'll actually go public next year, but we, we, we feel we'll be ready by then. Thank, Thank you. you. And here's Manifesto Wine. Yeah.